Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the AB 617 Courtside Community Steering Committee meeting for um, the September 2023 meeting. Buenos dias a todos. A la reunión del Comité Directivo de la Comunidad Courtside, AB 617. Um, y bienvenidos a nuestra reunión de septiembre del año 2023. At this moment, I'll hand over to Mike over to um, one of our wonderful interpreters, Vicky, who will provide instructions on how to access interpretation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, gracias. Primero voy a dar las instrucciones en español. Si están utilizando su computadora portátil o computadora de escritorio, favor de localizar el icono Configura de Globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla cuando este aparezca en un minuto y luego pulsen en Interpretación de Lenguaje, Language Interpretation, y luego seleccionen el idioma español. Si están conectándose desde su teléfono, iPad o dispositivo similar, busquen el menú con los tres puntitos en la esquina superior del lado derecho de su pantalla y pulsen también Language Interpretation y luego el español. Esto permite que escuchen la traducción al, al español con un 80% de volumen y luego el audio en inglés se escuchará al fondo con un 20% de volumen. Tienen la opción de apagar el audio en inglés pulsando Mute Original Audio, ubicado en el mismo menú donde eligieron el idioma español. Gracias. And now for those of you who speak English, in case someone is speaking in Spanish and you want to be able to hear them, you also, once the globe appears, if you're using a desktop or a laptop, It'll appear at the bottom of your screen and choose language interpretation with that globe and then English, which will give you the English channel. If you're connecting with a smartphone, an iPad or some other sort of uh, device, you will look for the three dots on the top right of your screen and then look for language interpretation, the globe, the language interpretation, and choose English. This way, if anyone's making a comment in Spanish, it will be interpreted on that English channel. If you're not on either channel, you're going to have to be fully bilingual or bilingual enough that you can understand either language. And that concludes the instructions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank you. Mm -hmm. we'll, give it, we'll give it a few seconds until Interpretation is launched. Thank you, Joanny. So the globe is now available um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so for those who need interpretation, please um, access um, the channel of your choice. And if someone, um, Anna, could you confirm that the Spanish interpretation channel is coming through? I don't sí. see the globe. Sí, perfecto. Yeah, I can confirm. Oh, Thank you. there it is. Thank you, John. Great, moving on. Next slide, please. Once again, I wanted to welcome everybody to the um, September 2023 Courtside Community Steering Committee meeting. We have um, a packed agenda today, so we'll do our best to um, move quickly while providing folks um, plenty of opportunity to ask questions and provide feedback on the various items. At this moment, I'll hand over to my colleague, Anna, who will go over the meeting objectives and agenda. Thank you, Chuy, and good evening, everyone. Um, so for today's meeting objectives, after we go over roll call, um, general updates, um, and the approval of today's um, meeting agenda and last month's notes, um, we will be receiving an update um, from the San Diego County Air Pollution Control District um, on the community air monitoring efforts, as well as projects um, that apply for the AB 617 incentive funding. And folks will be also having the opportunity to provide feedback um, on these items. Then we will be learning about um, and providing feedback as well on BAE systems um, on the San Diego Ships Repair Risk Reduction Plan for the Air District's Air Toxic Hotspot Programs. 
Um, and so again, for today's agenda, uh, after we go over roll call and general updates, um, we will go through the approval of last month's meeting notes and tonight's agenda, followed with um, an update presentation from the Air District on the Portside Community Air Monitoring, um, as well as an update on the Portside Community AB617 incentive funding up projects. Um, then we will have a presentation from uh, BAE risk reduction plan for the air toxic hotspots programs, along with the San Diego um, Air Pollution Control District. Uh, and then we will close the meeting with public comments and closing remarks. Um, and so for today's meeting agreements, um, just a reminder, um, first to create space for everyone to contribute. Um, step up if you're more on the quiet side and if you've had uh, chances to participate, um, step back. Um, only one person speaking at a time. Um, be respectful of each other, listen to each other's opinions, knowledge, and perspective. Um, be conscious of time so that we can get you all here um, on time. And then also um, just to speak slowly and clearly for our interpreters. Um, and so with that, we'll go ahead and move to the next item. So we'll uh, move into roll call. Um, okay, so let me pull up the sheet. Um, so again, when I call your name, feel free to say here, um, or if you're having any audio issues, um, go ahead and uh, insert in the chat. Um, so we'll go ahead and start, uh, Keith Corey. Keith. Sorry, was fumbling for the button. I'm here. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Uh, is Shelby Busso also here? No. Okay. No, Shelby, I think, is my alternate, and she attends the um, international border uh, version of this group. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Jack? I believe it's I'm here. Jack. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, Nasi, I believe I see. You. I'm here. Yes, good Thank evening. <clears throat> um, Sarah? I'm here. Good evening. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Thank you. Um, Lydia, I know you're here. <laughs> um, Commissioner Sandy Naranjo? Present. Thank you. Um, is Phil Gibbons here as well? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Tim? Here. Thank you, Tim. Um, is Mariela here as well? No, Mariela today. Okay, thank you. And uh, Nick? Hi, everyone. Here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Joy? Good evening. I'm here. Thank you, Joy. Um, Martin? Uh, present, and David is not here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Roman Partida Lopez? Okay. Uh, here. Good evening, Good evening. everyone. Um, Dr. Stephanie Yoon. Um, Jose Marquez Chavez. Uh, here. Thank you. And um, I, Diana, she's not. Okay. I'm here. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, Samantha. Good evening. I'm present. Good evening, thank you. Um, is Sergio here as well? Um, Diana? I am here. Leona is not. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Filomena Mar Marino? Uh, Janice? Present. Thank you. John? Hello, John. Um, Hillary Medina. Okay, Hillary. Um, Alicia Sanchez. Presente, buenas tardes. Gracias, buenas tardes. Um, Margarita Moreno. Presente. Gracias. Um, uh, Naomi. Uh, Vanessa. Um, 
Um, Salvador? Present. Thank you, Salvador. Uh, Montserrat? Presente. Gracias. Uh, Sylvia? Present. Thank you. Um, Ashley? Not seeing Ashley. Um, Josephine? Um, and then Maritza. Present. Thank you all. All right. Um, so with that, we make quorum for today's meeting. Um, and then I'll pass it back to Chewy. Thank you, Anna. For general updates today, um, we only have one coming from, um, or two. <laughs> I see your hand, Tim, um, starting with Phil um, from the Port of San Diego. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to let you all know, I'm going to put a link in the chat to our um, second year highlights report for our maritime clean air strategy. So as we head into October 2023, that marks the second year anniversary of when the maritime clean air strategy was adopted by our board. And um, uh, we'd like to commemorate the things that we've been working on in these public friendly um, handouts. So I just put it in there, even though the link says it's the first year highlights, it's actually really the second year highlights. So uh, don't be confused by that, but it, it summarizes a lot of the initiatives that the port has undertaken over the past two years to advance port electrification uh, for procurement of our cranes, um, acquisition of more um, electric vehicles in our own fleet, allocation of funding for more shore power to um, uh, provide uh, shoreside power to visiting ships that are coming to the port so they can reduce their emissions. Even summarizes a lot of the community outreach events that we've done and then has a whole page dedicated to um, what's coming next in the future that we can all talk about as part of this group. So I just wanted to direct your attention uh, to that and um, reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Can't believe it's been two years already. Great. Um, if it's okay with you, Tim, um, I'll move on with Commissioner Sunny Naranjo um, to keep stay with the port. Sandy? Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, hi everyone. This is uh, Commissioner Naranjo. Um, I just wanted to promote uh, the Port of San Diego. We have the Port Side Academy. Uh, this is our first cohort, and, and so we are uh, recruiting recruiting residents of our Port Side communities to really get an experience of our petrification projects and really learn how it works. It's uh, really Andy, it's you, know, um, you know Andy you're cutting off uh, we're going starting the fall so um this will be a total of five sessions. And so we're really encouraging, you know, our residents and our port side community to apply. Um, so uh, definitely could check out um, the information at portofsaniego.org backslash academy. And I could definitely send uh, the flyer and information to uh, the staff here. So we could forward it to the email chain. Thank you, Sandy, that'd be great. I think you were cutting off a little bit, but um, we heard the end of, of your message. Okay, great. Tim? Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Tim Garrett with Sandag. Um, so I wanna highlight uh, last Friday, um, September 22nd, our board of directors, Sandag board of directors, um, passed a resolution that relates to um, clean air and the SERP. Um, so the I'll put the link in the chat so you can look at the resolution after, but basically um, the resolution uh, directs the, the staff of Sandag to consider um, the goal of healthy communities and environment for everyone through the reduction of harmful air pollutants. 
um, as well, especially um, uh, as it relates to diesel particulate matter uh, in the 75th percentile or higher scores um, per Cal Enviro screen. Um, also consider health impacts and emphasis on disadvantaged communities that have historically borne a dis disproportionate share of pollution caused by transportation and support goals one through six of the, the port side SERP as they relate to the 2025 regional plan. Uh, so this was passed by our, our directors. Um, and that's, so that's a resolution for staff. So we'll be um, definitely taking all of that um, direction as we implement the 2025 regional plan. But just want to highlight that this is a um, direction that we're going to be going. And this is um, very much in consideration for SANDAG. Um, so, and then also want to highlight uh, upcoming October 4th is Clean Air Day. Um, so SANDAG and its partners are um, making it easy to get around uh, the region um, and supporting clean air activities. So transit is going to be free uh, on October 4th region-wide. Um, there's also all of the neighborhood electric vehicle um, programs throughout the region. Those are all free. Um, there's also some uh, codes that we have available for discounted uh, or free um, shared mobility um, through bikes and scooters uh, in the region. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat that has that information, um, but encourage folks uh, if they're able to um, uh, you ride transit or otherwise um, support Clean Air Day on October 4th. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for the reminder about Clean Air Day. Great. That concludes our general updates section. And just a reminder, um, we also welcome any emission reduction updates from folks. Um, just feel free to send me an email before the meeting and I, I can um, have you on the docket for general updates. Great. Moving on to our next agenda item, I wanted to open it up to um, the steering committee for um, consideration of approving last month's meeting notes and tonight's agenda. This is Jack, move approval. I'll second. Great. So the motion from Jack can um who seconded? I did. Uh Nick Bowden. Oh, thank you, Nick. Great. Um is there anyone opposed to the motion to approve the notes or tonight's agenda? Hearing or seeing none. Um so the agenda. And last month's notes are approved. Thank you all. Moving on to our first um, agenda presentation item. I want to hand it over to um, Kevin Bradley, who will give um, an update on portside um, community air monitoring efforts. Hi, can you hear me, Trey? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Bradley. Um, so with San Diego County Air Pollution Control District, um, I'm responsible for the group that uh, collects air samples and measures the um, air pollution data, analyzes um, some of the trends that we're seeing in the data. So um, that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I can go over a quick outline um, of what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, first up, before we get to diesel particulate matter, which is going to be the focus of today's presentation, um, I just wanted to outline what we're planning on doing for our future presentations in terms of kind of usually we present every three months. So um, just kind of what our target pollutants are that we're going to be talking about each of those three month periods uh, are going to be. Um, it's a tentative schedule, but it's kind of uh, what we're hoping will be a little more organized, a little bit more, you know, something where people can kind of understand and anticipate what it is we're going to be talking about um, as, as each meeting gets closer. Uh, so then I'll talk a lot about our diesel particulate matter monitoring program. Um, I'll give a little bit of recap on what the sources and health effects are, a little bit of the history um, of, of why we care about this pollution. Um, I'll briefly talk about the health standards, and then I'll go into what our data is actually showing us and some of the analysis that uh, my team has been performing. Uh, finally, uh, talk a little bit about how we can reduce the effect of this type of air pollution on community members, people who work and live uh, in the portside community. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the presentation schedule that we're looking at, obviously it's September right now. We're gonna talk about diesel particulate matter in this current presentation. 
um, when we talk about diesel particulate matter, because we can't measure that specifically directly, we measure both black carbon and elemental carbon, which are two markers of diesel particulate matter. So um, today I'm going to be focused more on black carbon. Uh, in the future, we'll probably talk more about elemental carbon as well. Um, this coming March, we are planning on talking about our airborne metals program. We started that back in, I think, January. So we'll have approximately a year worth of data, um, depending on what we're able to process by then, but we'll have uh, some more updates on that. And then similarly, uh, in June of next year, volatile organic compounds, uh, that program started a couple months ago in July. Um, obviously, there's a big gap there. December would be the other month um, on the three month schedule. But last year, we uh, canceled that meeting because of the holidays. So we may do something in January, but we haven't totally finalized what we're going to do with that fourth slot yet or how we're going to plan that out. So um, I'll keep everybody posted when we have a better idea of, of how we're going to handle that. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions or, or feedback on, on this proposed schedule. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so some of this is going to be kind of obvious recap kind of information, but I figured just to get everybody kind of grounded and on the same page, I'll talk uh, off the bat about what some of the sources are of diesel particulate matter. Um, so in the port side community, of course, we're going to be worried about trucks and, and ocean vessels just based on where, where we live. Um, and then other sources can include things like trains and construction equipment. Um, you know, Harbor Drive obviously has a lot of construction projects going on right now. So construction equipment can be another source. Um, I put generators on here. Uh, the, the subcommittee kind of told me basically that that's probably a much more minor source. But in case people use diesel generators, that it can be another source um, of diesel particulate matter. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I do want to go a little bit more quickly through these slides. I do have a bunch of slides, um, but I know that the health impacts are really the main reason why we care about this, right? So um, I'm going to start by in the middle of the slide, we have this graphic, right? And, and the main point here is that I, I want to kind of drive home how tiny these particles are and why that matters. So if you look at this picture, you can see this representation of sand. I think someone in the subcommittee said it looks like a little gold nugget, which I agree. Um, and then the fine beach sand particles are actually bigger than a human hair, and human hair is even bigger than what's called PM10, or particulate matter that is 10 micrometers or less in size. So a micrometer is just one one millionth of a meter, so a really, really tiny way of measuring something. Uh, and then even smaller than that, you have PM2.5, so same thing, particulate matter that is 2.5 micrometers or less. And so this graphic kind of shows how you can fit, you know, a tiny, tiny little PM2.5 particle. You could probably fit about 20 of those if you lined them up uh, one after the other inside of human hair. And why this is important is that these little particles can get really deep into people's lungs and into their bloodstream uh, and cause all sorts of health problems from there. Uh, a lot of these particles, especially when we're talking about diesel exhaust, are, are toxic chemicals. Uh, so things that we really do not want to be in people's lungs and in the bloodstream. Um, it can, when they do get into the human body, they can cause uh, different health effects, including worsening existing respiratory uh, issues, including asthma. Um, it can cause cancer. So, uh, per California Air Resources Board modeling, in, in the port side community, approximately 84% of the cancer risk from airborne toxic chemicals is specifically from diesel particulate matter. So again, this, this is why we're really, really focused on this. I know we spend a lot of time talking about this pollution, and the reason is because it's really one of the most important in terms of its, its health effects and its prevalence in the port side community. Um, some of the non-cancer health effects also, I mentioned asthma, there's cardiovascular disease, uh, lung and heart disease, and, and more. So um, I have a couple of U, uh, URLs on the screen. If, if, you want to, or if you're curious and you want to learn more about this type of pollution, uh, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has uh, more information on these. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this slide is really about kind of a history of diesel particulate matter. It's not a brand new chemical that we're just learning about. It's something that, that it, it's been in, in the awareness of, of air pollution folks for um, over 30 years now. Um, and so in the in the early 90s, California really began to try to limit the amount of this type of pollution getting into the air. Um, and I want to pause here and mention that I know a piece of feedback that, that I've gotten many times in these types of presentations is, can you just put something on these graphics that is just a horizontal line that shows us where the safe level is versus where the data is. And the problem with that is that the way that the health standards are expressed is typically in uh, basically excess cancer cases per million people. It's, it's tricky to get a number like that onto a graph like this. 
Um, so I'll do my best to contextualize, but the main thing that we're looking for is just a, a steady or a, a, a obviously ideally a very fast decrease, but just showing over time that we're seeing the levels of this type of pollution go down and down and down. And so we've seen that statewide with various programs that have been put into place, um, but we want to continue to see that in, in certain neighborhoods like the Portside community um, that, of course, has been nominated for the AB 617 program. And so it's it's a, a neighborhood where pollution levels tend to be elevated, um, especially when we talk about diesel particulate matter. Um, so all that being said, some of the programs that have been put into place in California include adding emission control systems to diesel equipment, replacing old engines with newer engines that uh, are more efficient and, and give off less pollution and uh, mandating that cleaner fuel is used uh, in diesel engines. So lowering the sulfur content is, is one example. Um, and so this graph kind of points to all these different strategies that were put into place at, at various times over the last 30 years or so. Um, and it's hard to kind of dig out which of those strategies led to the decreases that we're seeing statewide, but big picture, we wanna to try to implement as many strategies as we can to really drive this pollution down over time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so another piece of feedback I got from the subcommittee, uh, and, and I should say thank you to the subcommittee for taking the time uh, to meet with me last uh, in-person meeting. I got a ton of great feedback from everybody. Special shout out to Joy Williams for meeting with me individually. Um, and I really heard a lot. Can you please put a map up of where these sites are? So here's a map. This is much more spread out. The next slide, we're going to zoom in on port side. But just to give a little bit of context, um, all the way to the east there, you see Alpine. Um, that's kind of our background site. So we expect much lower levels of diesel particulate matter out at Alpine. There's not nearly as much traffic and, and sources and things like that. So that's that purple dot way out east on the map. Um, and these colors are going to maintain, uh, are, are going to stay consistent throughout this presentation. So whatever color is corresponding to each site, it's going to stay that way. So um, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll zoom in on the port side sites in a minute. I'll just also mention that down south by the border, we have a site at San Ysidro Fire Station, that's the orange dot, and at Donovan State Prison, which is our yellow dot there. Um, and so we will be comparing a little bit to the data we've gotten at Alpine and San Ysidro, and we recently started collecting data at Donovan. Um, so I'll get back to that uh, in a minute here. Uh, next slide, please. So zoomed in on Portside here. Um, I know National City uh, doesn't have any operational sites right now. We are working on getting our National City train depot site going. I believe uh, we finalized the permit to start building the fence. So we're hoping within a few months that we have a National City site up and running finally, which we're, we're very excited for. Uh, but as far as our current operational sites, uh, all the way to the west, right by the water there, the black dot represents the Marine Terminal. Uh, Sherman Elementary School is the darker blue dot. The light blue dot is Chicano Park. Um, that LCC uh, abbreviation is kind of weird. It's because it's on the corner of Logan and, Chica uh, and Cesar Chavez uh, Parkway. Um, and then the green dot is for our Boston Avenue site, which is at a Caltrans facility, hence the CTB abbreviation. And finally, our most inland site right off the 15 is our Ocean View Boulevard site. Uh, for the, and that's the red dot. So like I said, all of these colors will, will maintain throughout the presentation. So um, I wish I could just have this map up, you know, so if it was an in-person presentation, we'd have a big blow up of it next to me while I'm talking so that people could visualize. But um, at the end, if we want to go back and, and take a look at the map or anything, um, we should have some time for questions at the end. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so last thing before we get to the data, I do wanna mention how weather has a pretty strong impact, particularly when we talk about uh, diesel particulate matter and, and particulate matter more broadly, there's this temperature effect. So in the winter time or even at nighttime when the temperatures tend to be cooler, the air tends to be calmer, stay more in a, in a tighter area, doesn't mix or spread out as much, uh, which leads to higher particulate matter levels than in the summer or even uh, during the day, because there's big temperature swings from nighttime to daytime. Uh, the warmer air tends to mix more, spread out more, and so we see lower levels when the weather is warmer. So that's kind of the typical baseline trend we see as far as temperature relates to particulate matter. Um, of course, temperature is not the only weather phenomenon. There's rain, there's wind, there's all sorts of other things that matter in terms of where this pollution ends up and what levels we're seeing at, at which location. Um, but I will refer back to this, this concept of cooler weather tends to mean higher levels, hotter weather tends to mean uh, lower levels. So I'll, I'll refer back to this over the course of this presentation. So wanted to make sure to mention that before we get into the data. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, what we did with, with the data is we took essentially the averages of each hour of the day 
Um, thank you, Lydia. Uh, we took a, a um, average of each hour of the day and then plotted that on this graph. And so what we're seeing here is hour by hour, the levels, the average levels we're seeing at each of our sites, uh, including Alpine, Boston Avenue, Chicano Park, Marine Terminal, Ocean View Boulevard, San Ysidro, and Sherman Elementary School. And right off the bat, you can see the, the highest level that we're seeing is that orange line, which is our San Ysidro site. Uh, so in the morning time, we tend to see much higher levels at San Ysidro than, than the rest of the Portside sites or Alpine. Um, so what I wanna do though is zoom in on Portside again. So if we go to the next slide, so this is the same exact data, just with San Ysidro omitted so that we can kind of specifically talk about the port side sites. Um, and so if we start kind of at like four or five in the morning when the day's really just starting, traffic's gonna start picking up soon, the trucks are gonna start their routes, that's when we start to see the levels tick up in the early morning. Um, part of this is the sources are active, right? We have diesel engines operating, trucks, uh, ocean vessels, et cetera. Part of it is that the weather is still a little bit cooler. Um, it's not, the day hasn't warmed up yet, right? So we see the levels start to rise a little bit through the morning into the mid morning and then around 8, 9 a.m. they peak at each of the sites. Each site varies on when it peaks. Obviously, Marine Terminal is a little bit later when we see that highest peak closer to 9 a.m. But then the day starts to heat up and we start to see the levels dip back down to where they're going to be for the majority of the kind of late morning, early afternoon, <clears throat> where the levels are going to stay pretty low for the afternoon. Uh, then, of course, rush hour starts to pick up, maybe 3, 4, or 5 p.m., and we don't really see the levels start to pick back up until a little bit later, more like 6, 7 p.m. Um, again, that's when the temperature starts to cool off, so the air starts to compress more, and we start to see that pollution sort of get trapped by that cooler air. Um, and then through the evening, we really see levels start to stay pretty high all through 9, 10 p.m., um, and then, of course, you know, in the middle of the night, there's not really very many sources operating. So the, there's nothing putting more pollution into the air. So even though the air is cooler and not mixing as quickly, we're still going to see levels dip a little bit more as we get to the midnight, one in the morning. And then, of course, we go through the middle of the night and we pick back up uh, with the same cycle the next day. So that's the general trend we see day by day is that these trends are really tied to two things, rush hour and the temperature. Um, so when there's a lot of traffic and cooler temperatures, that's when we're going to see our highest levels and vice versa. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this one's kind of busy, I admit. Um, again, I want to point out two things off the bat. One, San Ysidro is the orange bar. And again, we see that it tends to be a little bit higher than the rest of the sites. Um, the other thing is that, so if we, um, again, the higher the bar is, the higher the black carbon levels are, hence the higher the diesel particulate matter levels are. Um, and we're splitting this up by season on this graph. So summer, spring, autumn, winter. Uh, and summer and spring are generally our warmer months in San Diego. So we see much lower levels there and the data reflects that. And then in the autumn, and the winter, cooler months, we see the higher levels. Um, so there's really nothing that surprised us on this graph. We expected basically the trends that we saw. Um, this does give us a little bit of a chance to compare site by site. So you can kind of see, for example, in the winter time, the black and the green bars are, are the highest for the port side sites. Um, and those are our uh, Marine Terminal and Boston Avenue sites. Excuse me, get a little bit of water. And actually, if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Back one slide, please. I thought I had taken San Ysidro off that. But anyway, um, yeah, so so we see that you know, Marine Terminal and, and uh, Boston Avenue tend to be the highest of the port side sites. Um, and then the purple bar, which represents Alpine, our, our quote unquote clean background air site, uh, tends to be much, much lower, particularly in the cool months, uh, exception being summer when everything is actually pretty similar um, across all these different sites. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this data is broken down by day of the week and um, the subcommittee and I spent a lot of time on this site. There was some stuff that surprised us and, and things we wanted to dig into and talk about more here. So. Um, you know, with the expectation that if this is tied to so strongly to traffic and weather, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we should see our highest levels. Those are the weekdays. That's when people are going to work. That's when we're going to have the most traffic. Um, but really what we're actually seeing is that um, it actually builds throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's kind of a steady increase. And then Thursday to Friday, we see a pretty substantial increase in the levels that we're seeing. And then Friday to Saturday, for some of the sites, we see even more increase. Um, specifically, I'll point out the green and the black lines, uh, Marine Terminal again, and, and Boston Avenue again. 
we actually see the highest levels on Saturdays, um, which which kind of surprised us. So we I, I don't have a specific answer for why that's the case right now. That's going to be something that we dig more into. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if, if anybody has suggestions or theories that that they want to flow to us, we're we're open to ideas as far as why. You know, Friday and Saturday, we're seeing higher levels than Tuesday, for example, when, you know, Tuesday traffic does tend to be pretty bad. So, um, you know, there may be information that we can get from the port or from Sandag or from somebody who, who maybe has some sort of idea of whether it's ocean going vessels. I think someone mentioned recreational um, ocean vessel like sailboats that need to use their engines to get past the surf before they can rely on their sails. Things like that may be a factor, but we don't really know specifically why Friday, Saturday we're seeing um these kind of elevated levels um we we do see on this slide again that the uh that orange trend line the san ysidro graph that we're seeing the highest levels in san ysidro still uh next slide please so the other thing um that we want to look at here is our long-term trends right i mentioned earlier that the main thing we want to see rather than talking about a specific number that or a target that we want to get the concentration below a certain point really we just want to see these this type of pollution go down and down and down and down over time as we're implementing more and more strategies uh, from the SERP, uh, the, the Emission Reduction Program. So um, off the bat here, you can kind of see that we do have a general downward trend. Obviously, there's a glaring exception. The furthest to the right, that uh, dark blue bar, is our Sherman Elementary School site. And it looks like the level shot up in 2022. But actually, what, what happened is we had a flow issue with our instrument that really made most of our data throughout the year of 2022 not usable. So the only data that we have from that year is in December. And like I mentioned, December, cooler month, typically higher levels. So that average looks a lot higher um, just because there's data missing from the, the remainder of that year. So in the interest of transparency, I didn't want to just hide that from everybody and not talk about it. I, I wanted to point it out and you know, let everybody know that um, that, that data just was missing and, and that we have only December data for, for uh, Sherman Elementary School. Um, Anyway, if we look at the remainder of the data, and actually, again, uh, San Ysidro tends to be much higher. If we go to the next slide, and this is the one that I actually removed San Ysidro from again so that we can kind of zoom in on the port side sites. So one thing uh, that you'll notice, Boston Avenue is missing. The reason for that is we actually installed that monitor late last year. So we don't actually have a full calendar year of data yet to have a, an annual average yet. So that's why that site is not here. Um, and then Alpine was not installed until 2020. So that one um, is absent in 2019. But big picture, we are seeing general downward trends in the levels of our data. So, um, if, you know, Sherman Elementary School is a pretty gradual dip from 19 to 20 to 21. Um, Marine Terminal, pretty drastically downward 19 to 20, and then slightly downward 20 to 21. And then it, Marine Terminal actually picks back up going from 2021 to 2022. So. Um, I tried to put in some horizontal dashed lines there to kind of show which ones go up, which ones go down, which ones stay more or less the same. Um, so many of the sites are showing a good downward trend, um, exception, of course, being Marine Terminal. Ocean View Boulevard really barely went down from 2021 to 2022. So um, that's kind of the, the general idea of what we're seeing. And, and of course, there's a huge caveat right in the middle of all this is, is the pandemic and how traffic patterns were completely out of whack for about two years there. So um, that is a factor, obviously, anytime we're talking about diesel particulate matter, the, the traffic patterns do have an impact on that. Um, but it is encouraging that, you know, into 2022, when traffic was somewhat back to normal, um, we continue to see downward trends, and especially with Chicano Park, um, as well as a slight decrease for uh, Ocean View Boulevard. So we do want to continue monitoring this um, over long periods of time to make sure that the strategies that I'll talk about in a couple minutes here are, are helping to drive these levels downward. And if we go to the next slide. So just a quick recap of sort of what we're seeing in the data. So first of all, we notice San Ysidro levels just tend to be higher than the rest of the county. Um, the time of day, we, we kind of dug out that the major impacts were rush hour and the temperature of the weather. Um, Day of the week, we saw the highest levels later in the week. So Friday, Saturday tend to be the highest, um, even higher than you know midweek when there's still plenty of traffic. Uh, time of year was really what we expected to be higher levels in autumn and winter, lower levels in spring and summer. 
And the long-term trends are we're seeing general improvements, obviously an exception at Marine Terminal, which, um, you know, that's kind of right there in the middle of where the, the modeling data would have told us a lot of the diesel particulate matter would be concentrated, um, but it's something for us to keep in mind. And then, um, you know, big picture, we want to continue to monitor black carbon um, to, to understand what diesel particulate matter levels look like over long, long periods of time as many of these strategies are, are being put into place so that we can make sure that the strategies are working and, and try to dig into whether there are additional strategies that we can implement to help further uh, reduce this type of pollution. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. So um, again, I wanted to wrap up this presentation by talking a little bit about what the strategies are, um, both from the APCD and CARB standpoint, so the, the Community Emission Reduction Program or the SERP, what some of the strategies are that directly pertain to, to diesel emissions. Um, and so those, of course, include zero emission trucks. There have been various presentations on the, the uh, initiatives and efforts around switching over trucking fleets to zero emission vehicles, whether they are electric vehicles, whether they're hydrogen fueled, um, how we're going to build the infrastructure needed to sustain trucking fleets, and also having incentive funding so that um, trucking fleets and, and businesses in the portside community have the, the funding they need to switch over their fleets or to update their vehicles to newer models or, or whatever the case may be. Um, also adding regulations around trucks, so whether it's a trucking route, so keeping trucks away from vulnerable populations, so sending routes away from things like schools, daycares, senior centers, places where, where children and the elderly may uh, congregate, and also um, enforcing the anti-idling rules that we have in place, so just making sure that diesel engines or, or diesel trucks aren't just sitting in one place idling, that tends to really drive up um, pollution, you know, in the near location to that truck. Um, and in addition to that, inspecting vehicles to make sure that they're operating correctly and, and not uh, putting out more pollution than they're supposed to be doing. Uh, land buffers can also be a big help, whether it's green spaces and parks or planting trees, uh, that they can be very helpful in reducing exposure to uh, people in, in communities that uh, live near, you know, areas where diesel might be uh, emitted. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, uh, improving the transportation uh, within the portside community, so things like bike lanes and improved sidewalks, uh, public transit, making sure that that's expanded as much as possible to have lots of different ways for people to get around. Um, establishing and or amending emission rules for indirect sources is a big one. That is what's going to cover things like the cargo handling equipment and the harbor crafts and, and things like that. So um, those rules are, are being put into place and reviewed. Um, establishing shore power for ships, I believe, um, I think it was Tim mentioned something about shore power. I could be that could be it could have been someone else, but um, you know, shore power for ships is another way to um, try to reduce the amount of pollution that the ships are putting into the air uh, as they you know dock near near the portside community. Um, and finally, putting air filtration systems uh, for for residents, for homes, schools, etc. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I, I intentionally left that for the last bullet point there because now I want to talk a little bit about not so much the uh, APCD and CARB side of things, but personal actions that uh, residents and and uh, people who work in the portside community can use to try to reduce the amount um, of this type of pollution that they encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. And so one strategy would be getting a home air filtration system. So I confirmed with um, my colleagues at APCD that the PAIR program is still running through next month. So there's a little bit of urgency to it because I believe that does expire soon. Um, but if you go to this uh, URL or scan that QR code, you can learn more about the PAIR program and how to get an air filtration system in your home. So highly recommend looking into that. Um, beyond that, just kind of little things like ventilating your home, you know, even if, if you're cooking on a gas stove, just having your windows open can, can be very helpful, especially during the low pollution, hour, uh, low pollution level hours. Um, in addition, um, if you're, you know, sitting on the freeway in traffic, having your windows up, having circulated air on is, is a good idea. If you're sitting in traffic, chances are there are uh, diesel trucks near you also sitting in traffic that are putting out pollution. So just um, your, your car does have an air filtration system on it. So trusting that and, and having your windows up is, is a good strategy as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, avoiding idling in your own vehicles, or especially in diesel vehicles, um, is always a good idea that you know, idling vehicles tend to put out, you know, a lot of pollution. And so uh, minimizing that is, is really um, in everybody's best interest. Uh, using the trolley is, is great. It's an all electric vehicle. Um, I know there's, there's plenty of stops within Portside that can connect to other parts of San Diego. Um, so that's 
another option. Um, and finally, anybody who has existing respiratory issues, just uh, limiting outdoor activity during those peak hours. Um, I mentioned on the one uh, graph about time of day, it's really kind of 7 to 9 a.m. is when we see the highest levels in the morning and kind of 7 to 10 p.m. is when we're seeing the highest levels in the evening. So um, avoiding, you know, those times of, you know, if, if you want to go for a jog, maybe avoiding that time of day to do that or, or walking the dog or anything like that. So um, again, if possible, I know this isn't the most convenient recommendation, but um, just in the interest of not encountering diesel uh, pollution in your day-to-day -day life, um, this is kind of you know, what we came up with in terms of strategies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I have my contact info as well as uh, my supervisor, David Sodeman, and uh, Domingo Gihil, our, our deputy director, who um, many of you probably have met already. Um, so really, if you have any questions, feedback, concerns, anything at all, um, if you want you know, anything to do with APCD, you can reach out to me. If I'm not the person that can answer your question, I will do my very best to find the person who is. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we really want to continue hearing from the community. Um, I, I personally am really grateful for the, the subcommittee, like I mentioned, um, and, and everybody who's taken the time to help us sort of work on these presentations and figure out how to make them hopefully better and more accessible for the community and, and continue to improve upon that. So um, thank you, everybody. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'm, I'm here for, for questions if, if there are any. Thanks so much, Kevin, um, and great presentation. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And um, just um, for sake of time, please um, keep your comments short and direct so um, folks have time. other folks have time to ask their questions. Starting with John. Uh, yes, uh, I've brought this up in the past, but you know, um, I think everyone, because I, I work with many, many uh, uh, residents here locally, and the, the question is, is what can that little filter do that's been you know put out? Well, does it, is it helpful? Yes, but the bottom line is this: all that pollution and whatnot has to come into your house before it'll take it out, and hopefully, grandma and grandpa got uh, one of those little air filters. But how about the kids in the next uh, in the next room? My point is this: there are uh, um, systems out there, like the the mini splits, uh, which I've talked about before. And uh, if if it's for medical necessity, which obviously this is, uh, you can have those things deducted off of your taxes. And there's other kinds of programs that would allow you to have both air heat uh, and filtered air before it even comes into your building. So why wouldn't we go for that? Um, yeah, they're a little more expensive than the uh, the filter systems, but we're talking about lives here. And I what I would really like to see is, you know, some of the uh, uh, <laughs> some of the folks like yourself there uh, be able to speak to this. Uh, I'm going to be doing this myself. Um, where you know I have a sleep apnea machine and my machine, I've shown the filters around, they come out grayish black, okay? I'm supposed to change them out every 30 days and I'm having to change them out every seven to nine days because there's so much pollution in the air. And I'm right here on Logan Avenue. So what I would like to see the city, the feds, anybody else who actually gives, uh, you know, a hoot uh, to help us work with many of the families who aren't even aware of these split mini splits uh, that can solve at least 70 to 80% of the problem while they're in the home. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. And and if in the future, if you come across any more information about other filtration systems or any anything related to this, please don't hesitate to reach out, email me. I can try to get information um, either to our team, um, our incentives team, or figure out what other ways we can try to get funding or um, any kind of resources out to the community. Um, so yeah, thank you. Well, and I'm working on that right now. And uh, the bottom line is I've got a couple of manufacturers and um, I'll be uh, uh, presenting my information here at our next meeting, but it would be wonderful if we could get behind this thing as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, uh, we should be able to get not only state but federal money's uh, thrown at us for, for this medical situation that we're in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think to Sarah, followed by Jose. 
Thank you, Kevin. That was that was really informative and, and appreciate all the feedback you took. So those those graphs show really not diesel particulate, but black carbon, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And I apologize if I wasn't clear enough about that. But yeah, we can't measure diesel particulate matter directly. Um, it's kind of a subset of particulate matter more broadly, and you can't really just sort yeah. the particle so, and pick out ones that are diesel. So the, the, you know, we, when we sat in our group, of course, the idea that the, the values went up on the weekends was a little bit of a head scratcher. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if we looked into whether um, things like um, beach fires or residential wood burning had contributed to any of that. Um, I So we haven't necessarily looked into that yet, but um, like I said, we're, we're open to any kind of suggestions or explanations that people might have so we can try to figure out um, big picture, obviously, we collect this data, not just to collect data, but to understand if the strategies in the SERP are having an impact on, on lowering these levels. And so if yeah. there's something going on that's escaping those strategies, beach fires, for example, we need to understand that as well. So um, yeah, definitely. So you said beach fires and uh, something about residential. Like if people were burning wood in their fireplaces at home. Like barbecues and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I will, I will try to dig in more into that and um, hopefully have more information in the near future. Yeah. It, it just occurred to me, those are activities that are mo probably more likely to occur on the weekends. So. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Also. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Excellent presentation. Um, and I'm very really happy to see that uh, the trend is, is downwards for for pollution in our community. The how do we compare to statewide or regional trends? So statewide um, is a little tricky. Um, every I don't want to get too technical here, but the uh, the way that we calibrate our black carbon instruments, um, we use these very specific filters that help us sort of identify what the instrument should be measuring versus what it is measuring. And those um, kind of vary by location that those filters, um, this isn't the greatest explanation I've ever given, but um, as far as statewide, um, I would need to get more data and, and more information from other districts. Um, so I'll make a note to, to reach out to South Coast, Bay Area, San Joaquin, and see um, you know how the port side and, and how San Diego County specifically measures up relative. I think a lot of that data is available. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I was, I was a little more focused specifically on San Diego County and, and comparing to, like I mentioned, Alpine, which is kind of our clean air um, site. But you could see on, on the data slides that we had earlier that Alpine tended to have pretty low levels across the board um, relative to what we're seeing in, in Portside and, and at San Ysidro. So, um, yeah, the, the levels have tended downward since 2019, since we began monitoring, but obviously, um, you know, we want to continue driving those levels further and further down to ideally match what we're seeing at Alpine or, or anywhere else, because um, there's no level of diesel particulate matter in the air that, that we're going to be like, cool, that's a good level. Like we, ideally, it'd be zero. Obviously, the reality of the world is that's, that's not possible, but um, we want to keep driving it down and down and down as much as we can um, with all these various strategies. Um, so I, I know I didn't totally answer your question as far as how we measure up to the rest of the state, and I can try to get more information on that to get back to you. But um, does that give you at least a little bit of an answer to your question? Yeah, and I think it's important to compare ourselves with other uh, with the region as a whole and, and other uh, and other places uh, because um, let's say that statewide we're um, also trending down. So uh, it will be good to know if our strategies have been identifying the SERP actually are contributing or they were just riding the wave of statewide policy, mm -hmm. statewide policy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, any individual neighborhood is going to have its own considerations, its own um, strategies are going to work better than others. And I think that's really what the value is uh, in having a, a steering committee like this is, is we get to hear from residents and, and business and, and industry within within the Portside community that, that knows that community better than anybody else is going to. So um, definitely thank you for, for your feedback. Jack. Thanks, Joy. Um, thanks for that presentation, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, my um, 
Um, my question is, is this, and, and, and it's both a question and a comment. And I guess the question is, is the district capable of, of identifying where the sources of black carbon or diesel particulate matter are actually coming from that are impacting the Portside community? Um, and are, are you able to, uh, to rank the, the sources that impact the community in terms of their overall uh, impact, uh, be that local truck activity, wood burning fireplaces, wood burning restaurants, uh, the freeway, what, whatever those may be, is there, uh, I, I think it'd be helpful to know how those sources stacked up in terms of which were the most threatening of those sources so that we could then look at measures to address that. Most of the measures that have been mentioned here tonight are all about activities that would occur inside the community, whether it's a filter in your house or um, uh, uh, not, nothing that really uh, addresses the possibility that the majority of black carbon and diesel particulate matter could be coming or at least in what we've seen in some of our previous monitoring is coming from a freeway. So if it's coming from the freeway, um, and it would be nice to know what, how significant that is and whether or not there's anything that we can do in the community that's actually gonna affect um, these sources that are being generated by freeway traffic. So I guess I go back to that basic question, are you able to identify what the relative uh, sources are and, and how they stick up, stack up uh, uh, in terms of what, which are generating black carbon most of the worst and for the community? I, I'll, I'll take this one, Kevin. Oh, thank um, goodness. Okay. Jack, this is this is David Sediman, uh, the chief of monitoring over at APC. What you're really asking, um, and it's a great question, and it's it's a very 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 important question to have answered, is really a, a source apportionment. You know, what sources are contributing to the pollution in the community, um, and and that uh, is is something that APC doesn't really have that expertise of to do. Um, but CARB does, and they have presented um, their initial assessment uh, a couple years ago to this, and, and that's what Kevin alluded to in one of his early, earlier slides by saying, you know, 84% of the cancer risk in the community is coming from diesel particulate matter. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, um, they, they did kind of could break down what those sources were uh, in that presentation. And so I think as we move forward with the SERP, I, I think we're going to want to ask CARB to come back and revisit that source apportionment modeling um, to see, you know, based off of the monitoring data, based off the emissions inventories that the facilities are submitting to CARB and to APCD, um, you know, what, what has been the result of those SERP strategies? Uh, thanks, David. I guess, you know, my, 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 concern is that it would have been nice to know have CARB's impact or input on what the relative share of emission responsibilities were, um, how they were being apportioned before we even commit, uh, created a CERT uh, because we could find ourselves here in a couple of years having taken all these steps for electrification and reducing the emission sources in the community come to, and then to find out that they really only amount to 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. Just, we just, we haven't had that information presented to us. And I think that would inspire a much more effective uh, emission reduction plan if we were to know more about the specific sources. So is there, um, is there a way we can get an update from, from CARB on this? Um, so we know that we're headed in the right direction with our own CERT? That, that's, a, that's a good question. And I mean, I think we can definitely bring that, um, you know, see, see if CARB uh, is willing to present some, some updated or new information, um, you know, at a, at a future meeting. Thank you, I think that'd be great. Thank you, Second David. Um, Nick, followed by Phil. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for the the presentation. Um, yeah, I I am very happy that we have a SERP here in the port side. Uh, and you know, 
touching on kind of um, the, the the presentation. I, I appreciated the detail in uh, the specific locations throughout the port site where that where you all are doing the monitoring. Um, I wanted to ask though. I mean, I, I feel like the objective is to always connect things back to the SERP, and I I feel like what was missing for me was kind of uh, a slide that kind of aggregated all the DPM levels together and tracked how we're progressing towards our goal of an 80% reduction of uh, 2018 levels. And, mm -hmm. I, and I feel like we're getting like the individual pictures where we're identifying kind of a downward trend, but I, I, I it's still not super clear for me in understanding um, how we're progressing towards that 80% reduction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and and I think I think that serves twofold. I think as a CSC, if we see that that progress isn't as quick as we want, I think that can kind of empower us to take more direct action and and. I don't know, doing more outreach into our neighborhoods and, and making sure that businesses are transitioning quicker. Um, but having that super clear illustration of how we're progressing towards that goal would be super helpful. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. One, I mean, definitely I agree. Having a more quantitative look at what the goal is, where we started versus where we are versus where we want to get to. Um that, that should be the goal. And that's something that I can definitely try to highlight in future presentations. Um, the other thing I know you mentioned since 2018, whatever the levels were in 2018, we want to see an 80% reduction. Um, it's As far as I know, the earliest we started collecting data as part of this program was 2019. And then of course there was the pandemic and then we had a massive amount of staff turnover. Um, I started just over a year ago and then the majority of my team started late, or mid to late last year. So we're um, in a lot of ways, playing catch up with some of the data that was still being collected, but still figuring, we're still figuring out sort of how to organize that. Um, so all that is to say, um, I, I totally agree that just being able to see, you know, specifically, hey, our circle is 80% reduction. How are we doing on that? Um, that could be a, a goal and, and something that I can really um, focus on in future presentations. So, um, yeah, thank you for that feedback. And I will um, try to incorporate that, incorporate that in the future. Thanks, Nick. Phil, followed by Joy, and Joy will be your last comment for this item. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Kevin. As always, that was a good presentation of complex information, so I appreciate your ability to, to provide that in an easy format for us. Uh, I was kind of kind of go where Nick was, too, and I think Jack was as well on on how we measure our progress, um, the a baseline was created, and, and frankly, I wasn't part of the group when the baseline was created. But maybe somebody could provide some insight on what was that baseline based off of for the SERP, um, because the number came up somehow. I don't know if that was with direct monitoring of air or if it was just activities that occur within the you know, within the region to come up with a, a baseline. Um, so that's a question just, you know, to perhaps anybody, but um, I did want to address also Jack's um, question regarding a breakdown of the sources. I went back to the CARB data that they presented to us a little bit earlier this, this year on their um, toxics modeling, and they um, were pretty... Um, well, they, they said it very directly, the main sources of DPM are on-road mobile sources, that's 56%, with 32% from Interstate 5 that runs right through the community. So that's, you know, part of the apportionment that they they provided with their with their analysis. Good to know, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, a big thing for, for me and my group will be, you know, as we've kind of settled into our roles here is, is digging into you know, historically what was done that sort of 2018 to 2021 period by the people that worked on this before us and understanding what baselines were generated, what the data said at the time versus what it says now, um, all, all of the kind of history of the program. I know it's kind of weird to talk about the history of a program that's only five years old, but um, really when we're looking at these goals, we do want a, a way to quantitatively measure um, 
I, I know I earlier said that we really want to see kind of sustained decreases, whether, you know, there's an exact number or not, but, um, but, you know, the, the 80% reduction strategy is, is obviously a, a key part of the SERP. And so um, agreed. And, and also thank you for um, digging up the, uh, the carb data there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky problem in terms of, you know, you have this freeway and you can't, you can't say where every individual car and truck is going to or coming from. So um, it's, it's going to be an ongoing problem um, in terms of just figuring out what strategies are going to continue to drive those levels down. Um, but, but I think the hope in terms of, you know, for example, electrification is that that just kind of has a um, continual effect of more and more trucks being, even if they're not um, electric or hydrogen power, just newer fleets, um, you know, one of the California statewide strategies, um, specifically with ports, is that uh, newer vehicle, newer model year vehicles have to be used as of certain years. I think as of January 1st of this year, it was 2010 or newer. And so um, the goal there is just to have newer trucks on the road so that the older trucks that emit more are, are not present. And so um, things like that are, are, you know, ongoing goals that we may not see the levels come down all at once, but um, the hope is that as, as all of these strategies are put into place over time, that we continue to see the the reductions that in, in some ways we're seeing. Obviously, the, the marine terminal data kind of has stagnated a little bit, but um, yeah. I, sorry, Phil, was there a, a question in, in there that I was supposed to, was I going to answer? I might have missed a question. No, no, I think you're, you're, you're good. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, just, you know, maybe continued discussion with with folks and maybe I need to do my due diligence to understand what that baseline what what went into the establishment of of the baseline was it air monitoring data or actually was it kind of activity based data mm -hmm. anyways I can take that up offline Phil I think it was the last year prior to when we started working on the SERP I think we started really kind of working on the SERP in 2019 and so they they said okay let's use last year that's that's a good goal it's it's the most up to date most current year um and I, i'm not too sure if it was actually based on any anything like that or it's just hey we're going to start working on it we want last year which is probably going to be the highest year to be our baseline okay yeah Thanks. and just briefly i know we gotta, we gotta get joy's question in but um to your point about um i guess and, and to jack's point about understanding you know specifically if the serp strategies are working um I don't, you know, I don't think we have to say we wrote the SERP in 2019. We have to stick with every detail in that. I mean, as we learn more information and gather more data, we, we need to be flexible and understand that we need to, you know, tailor the strategies to what's going to work, not just what we said was going to work a few years ago. So um, I, I definitely am, am in favor of continuing to look at the strategies. I mean, that's really the whole point of, of collecting this data. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, I am taking up a ton of our time here. So um, go to Joy. Uh, Hi, yes, thank you for that presentation. And I agree with Nick that the 80% DPM reduction goal is the important one that we need to keep an eye on. But I did want to remind everybody also that we are still looking to CARB for help to give us uh, some estimates of what is the health risk from locally generated pollution so that we could then create a goal for reducing that pollution. So that would be, um, you know, presumably health risk that's directly achievable with policies in the SERP. So just to remind everybody, you know, that's something that's in the goals. And I think we are still looking to CARB for some help to finalize that. Thank for the comment. Reminder. Great. Thank you all for the great discussion. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David, for jumping in on those questions, too. Moving along to our next item, since we are a bit behind, um, I want to hand over the mic over to Kathy Keehan, who um, will be giving us an update on incentive projects. On some direct actions. So we're going to talk about um, getting some feedback on uh, the latest updates on our incentive programs and some questions for you all today. So we provide incentive funding for clean air projects through the Community Air Protection Program or the what we call our AB 617 incentives program. It focuses on replacing diesel equipment with other cleaner machines to reduce pollution from those old engines. 
Part of the process is to get feedback from all of you, from the steering committee members, on what our program priorities should be. In our discussions previously, we've certainly heard um, loud and clear that the steering committees want us to prioritize zero emission equipment like electric trucks. We've heard this, and because of this, we've set up the program to approve all zero emission projects first and then fund whatever else we can with the rest of the funding. Next slide, please. Just as a reminder, the AB 617 incentive funding is, in, is to encourage projects that benefit disadvantaged communities, those communities as defined by the state of California. This map on the screen shows the communities in San Diego according to the Cal Green 4.0 uh, measuring tool. This year, tribal areas are also included. So you'll see some of those um, new areas in yellow toward the north of the county. At least 70% of the AB 617 incentive funding must be spent on projects that benefit people in these yellow areas. Next slide, please. The AB 617 incentives are also intended to help people in low income communities. This map shows those communities in blue. At least 80% of the AB 617 funding must be spent on projects that benefit people in either disadvantaged or low-income communities. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, um, AB 617 incentive funding can fund two types of projects. One is our regular Moyer and AB 617 traditional projects that we replace diesel engines and machines with cleaner ones. The second is specific projects that are identified in the community emission reduction plan. So that, for example, this year includes the port side zero emission truck pilot project, which we're gonna hear a little bit more about. Next slide, please. To give some historic perspective, just to get you guys caught up on where we are, over the past six years, we've been awarded about $71 million from the state. Um, for AB 617 incentives. Of that, we've contracted or paid out almost $40 million of that funding so far. Currently, we have about $31 million left that we can allocate on new projects. Next slide, please. Um, the $40 million or so that we've already been contracted out has gone to replace or repower 88 pieces of equipment like boats, trucks, and agricultural equipment. Of these 88 projects, 23 are electric and four are charging stations that support those electric projects. And those are in the process of being installed. Next slide, please. So for the $31 million that we still have available to allocate through our AB 617 incentive funding, we asked companies in January and February to submit applications as part of our regular solicitation. You may remember that we take applications for all of the programs at the same time every year. So we um, take applications for Moyer projects, AB 617 incentives, our farmer program and our goods movement program. Um, this year, we received 238 applications requesting over $83 million in funding for all of those programs. The applications are actually, we've left the applications open. Um, so if there are businesses or companies that are listening in today, we are still accepting applications in our programs. Um, we would put those on a backup list once we get through the um, contracting for the eligible applications this year, we'll start working on those backup projects. As we evaluate the projects, we find which ones meet all of the criteria and how much they can qualify for. Next slide, please. So right now we're in the, in the process. It's hard to see on this slide. I apologize. It's the green kind of in the middle there. This shows a timeline of where we are in the process. We're ready to approve projects and put applicants under contract to do those projects pending feedback from the steering committees, which we're doing tonight. Next slide, please. So here's a breakdown of the projects that we received that met the requirements of the AB 617 incentive program. Um, all of these 61 projects benefit people in the disadvantaged communities 
and are eligible for approximately $10, $10.5 million in funding. Included on this list are zero emission trucks, diesel marine vessel repower projects, and agricultural equipment replacement projects, natural gas buses, and cross-border uh, natural gas trucks are included in this group of projects. I'll leave that slide up for a minute so people can take a look at, at what those look like. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? This is just a graphic kind of showing um, in general where those projects are. Um, there are zero emission trucks, marine equipment and infrastructure for port side. There are natural gas school buses, agricultural equipment a little further south, and um, uh, those natural gas uh, cross-border trucks you could see down in Otay Mesa. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take a break here. I saw a couple of questions pop up in the chat, um, but we just wanted to get your thoughts about the project mix and the funding level for these applications we have in-house. Are we, um, we don't have much control over what projects people apply for, but we can set priorities for what we want to fund first. And if we were in a situation where we had more projects than funding, we would um, choose the, the priorities of the community. Does the project list this year meet the priorities of the community? We'd like to hear your feedback on that. Any comments so far? I'm going to scroll through the chat too. Um, were there community identified priority funds um, from Janice? Yes, the community has identified, like we were talking about before, the zero emission truck pilot project um, is a community identified project specifically for Portside. So I hope that answers your question there. How do you apply? I can um, put the I can put that link in the chat um, if people are interested in applying. And it looks like we have some hands up. Um, John, do you have a, a question or a comment real quick? Yes. How about for local small nonprofits? I work with about uh, 10 schools, 3,500 kids. I do crisis intervention, suicide counseling, and I do a lot of outdoor activities. Our biggest issue is finding a vehicle that would support anywhere from uh, six to nine uh, individuals at a time. And um, can we apply for something like that? Most of our projects are um, replacement. If you have a diesel van that you wanted to replace, that's a possibility. Well, we um, have a diesel truck. Then, yeah, let's talk offline, John, and, and see if you would qualify for our program. Okay. Send me an email. Okay. Okay. Tim. Great. Thank you. And I apologize if I missed this. I think you said that okay. like 80 percent of the funding needs to go to the disadvantaged communities that you had on the map. Was there a requirement that the like those vehicles or the infrastructure is located in or directly benefits like uh, the AB 617 communities, for example? Or do we have any idea of like these applications, um, like if they're operating in the portside community or the other AB 617 communities, for example, because um, my 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 thought would just be that the a priority would probably be on improve you know the existing operations within the port side community and trying to reduce the emissions there. Whereas um, I would think that reducing emissions elsewhere is you know still great, but it doesn't necessarily um, help achievement of the SERP, for example, and implementation of the SERP. Sure, that's a a good question, Tim. And the guidelines do not specify. Um, did they don't specifically call out the um, designated communities as a particular funding priority. I think if we had, um, if we didn't have enough money and we had to choose to prioritize project, if we had to choose between projects in Portside and projects outside, um, I expect that we would prioritize the the projects that benefit uh, Portside and international border community. But I'd like to hear from the steering committee if. Um, that's just my sense of it. Um, so we'd like to hear from you all if that would be um, that would be a priority. Um, Margarita. Buenas tardes. Este, buenas tardes. Estaba viendo la tabla pre preliminar, pero 
pero ahí no se especifica dónde se invierte para lo de cero emisiones. Sé que cambios están de fuera en cero emisiones. No sé si, oh. no sé si okay. sea solo para las grandes empresas o también se están beneficiando las empresas pequeñas. Mm. Gracias, Margarita. ¿Te dijiste esto, Kathy? Um, that's a good question. Oh, okay. um, the zero, the zero emission trucks are specifically in port side. So those 15 zero emission trucks are in port side. I don't have a breakdown. I think most of them are large businesses. I don't think, um, I'll have to get back to you and see if any are benefiting small businesses in Portside. Okay. Um, Keith? Hi, Kathy. Um, I'm not sure where this comment goes. I don't think it's specific to the incentive programs for converting um, combustion engine vehicles to electric. However, um, you know, we are watching and are supportive of the port's activities uh, um, through their MCAS to convert to electric trucks. And I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar that, you know, as much as we want to be supportive and helpful in that effort, um, one thing that has been brought to our attention that we are, have to look at closely is how, what sort of impacts um, much heavier trucks, because electric trucks are much heavier, have on our current um, infrastructure, uh, our roads, um, specifically through uh, the portside communities, um, AB617 communities. Um, clearly, we're very supportive in making these conversions, but just wondering from an incentive standpoint, are you all aware of any um, similar funding streams that might be available to um, supportive cities that want to be partners in this effort, but also need to understand that uh, O&M costs go way up once you put that much weight um, onto existing streets. I would like to say I have an answer for you on that, Keith, but I don't. No, um, I, it was rhetorical. I want to just okay. throw it out there. I know that that is not necessarily your wheelhouse, but uh, it's just something that um, I'm thinking about as we talk about these um, electrification conversions um, and all the incentive programs that go along to the businesses and eventually to residents who are making these conversions. Um, I think sometimes we forget that there are other impacts to surrounding infrastructure. Sure. Um, I'll take that as rhetorical and we'll keep an eye out um, on that. I'm sure you're not the only person thinking about it. Right. Uh, statewide. I think we're all looking at this. Yeah. Okay. Um, Phil. Thanks. Hi, Kathy. Um, hey, Phil. Yay. Hi. Um, thanks for that that presentation. Um, and can you break down a little bit for us as a steering committee, um, the trucks that are poised to receive funding? Like, what are we talking about? Medium duty trucks, like, you know, heavier pickup type trucks, cargo vans, all the way to the, you know, the tractor trailer trucks or the semi trucks that you know are moving freight like where's it's, that money going to it's been a surprising mix actually okay. for us uh phil on that there are quite a few medium duty trucks we're looking at kind of the bigger stake and flatbed trucks that people are using to haul things around we do have a couple of class eight trucks i believe in the project mix and a a few um, zero emission buses that are that are working in Portside that are um, shuttling employees around, for example. So there's a, a pretty good mix of, um, but they're all heavy duty uh, trucks and and buses. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's helpful to know. And as as you know, I mean, I've been trying to work hard to spread the word about your program and encourage adoption of these vehicles and the port has incentive funding too that we could help any of the operators that are coming to our terminals to sweeten the deal if you will um and you know i've been struggling to get that money to them honestly um because not a lot of people have raised their hand to take up the cause yet i think that will change so i would make the pitch to you that you know um have some money available for for more trucks in the future certainly because you know that is a big goal of this of this group as well as our maritime clean air strategy. Um, 
I'd also put in the pitch for funding for um, um, cargo handling equipment at the port. Um, that is, you know, when we did our health risk assessment, cargo handling equipment does pose a, a significant risk to the community. And so that that area specifically, um, the zero emission equipment that's becoming available is well suited for the operational duty cycles. And so I know our tenants and operators at the port are looking for any and all funding to uh, support conversion. And if if there's uh, funding here locally, I think that that could go a long way to, to, to make that happen. So that's my Thanks. pitch for cargo handling equipment. I, I like it, Phil. And I, I was remiss in that I did not uh, thank both the port and EHC for the outreach that you all have been doing um, to help us promote these programs. You've done a lot of work with that, and we really, really appreciate it. Cargo handling projects are um, currently eligible for funding through these programs, but we need to work on broadening them like we did for the zero emission truck pilot to um, to make them work better for tenants at the port, and we're working on that. I think we'll do one more quick question. I know we have another bigger question that we want you guys to weigh in on here in a minute, but um, Janice? Thank you. Thank you, I did write my comments in the chat to please prioritize the port side communities, um, just looking at the census tracts and all of the health impacts and being that is the, the group that is here working to prioritize um, the remediation of our air quality. Um, I also want to address, yes, we want to reduce, it's a definite priority to create infrastructure and to reduce emissions from existing vehicles that are big polluters, little polluters. But what about investing in those that have been working to create greening opportunities for the community? So I don't know um, how extensive the outreach was for the local, even thinking hyper-local um, small community-based environmental justice or um, greening communities. I'm sorry, I'm at a loss for words here, but really okay. making sure that they have the opportunity to continue to do the remediation work, the sustainability work to make that sustainable. Because um, we're seeing a lot of stopping the pollution, but what about those that have been working to make the community more green? And so there's a lot of barriers there um, maybe some technical assistance in creating um, more of those green spaces or investing in, you know, park strip, green areas, trees. I know I keep bringing that up, but it just seems like such a logical solution with the carbon sequestration, it's natural, and, and with the high-tech um, solutions. And again, it's very top-down, you know, um, we could do our homework a little bit more, but we're not hearing about these opportunities of those that are struggling and scrimping and saving for um, creating healthier communities with the um, remediation and environmental justice efforts. And here's all this money to stop the, to help the, those that have been polluting, but not those that have been working to clean the environment and bring more green opportunities. Thank you. Great. Janice, yeah, we'll, de we'll definitely take that feedback back. Um, the AB 617 incentives we're talking about today are not the only funding that's available to work in the communities. And so we should coordinate and see if there are other programs as well that may be able to help um, with the work that you're doing. So I'm gonna try and reach out to you and, and see if there's opportunities there. Um, but really good feedback and we should think about it. Chewy, can we go to the next slide, please? squeaky. So the um, the projects that we showed you, oh, oh. Yeah, okay, Kathy. Thank you. Good work, translators. We know we're keeping you busy tonight. Um, okay, so 
as we mentioned, there's about $31 million in, in AB 617 incentive funding available for us to spend. We have about $10.5 million in eligible projects, which means we have an extra $20 million that doesn't have a home yet. Um, we were we are coming to you tonight to ask if the steering committee would consider spending some of that, not all of that money, um, but some of that funding for buses that serve low income communities, but are outside disadvantaged communities in the county. And so if you could go to the next slide, please. So we received a um, uh, bunch of uh, applications. We had strong demand this year for zero emission school buses. Um, this graphic shows where those school buses um, would operate. It's mostly in the low income communities in the northern part of the county. Um, so we wanted to see if there was support at the steering committee level to using up to 10 million, but probably less than that, of in, of that AB 617 incentive funding to provide funding for electric school buses in these low income communities outside the disadvantaged communities. And I think Chewy, we have a poll to maybe get feedback on that question, right? Yes, that's right. Um, Kathy, I'm going to propose um, right after we finish this poll, if we could transition to the next presentation, just because- sure. Absolutely. Good item. So, um, once folks finish um, filling out the poll, um, please feel free to reach out to Kathy if you have other questions on eight six incentive funding. Uh, and if there's enough interest, maybe we can have Kathy provide a follow-up update at the next meeting. I'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. How's our polling? Great, so we have about a third of folks who have responded. So we'll give it a few more seconds. I'm deliberately not voting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your time this evening. I'll squeeze that in while we're waiting for the, the voting. Really appreciate the feedback of the community. Yes, thanks, Kathy. Great. Giving it five more seconds and then we'll show the results and move on to the next agenda <laughs> item. Great. Could you show I'm on the pins and needles? Awesome. Okay. Great. So it looks like almost 75% um, are in agreement or shared yes, they would be okay with spending 10 million to supporting electric bus conversions in low income communities outside disadvantaged. Thank you very much. With that, we're off to the next agenda item. Appreciate all of your help and support tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can add your email in the chat, Kathy, that'd be great. great. Joanny, if you can move on to the next agenda item. Hand the mic over to Mosen, who will give a presentation on the risk reduction plan. Mosen. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mosen Nazemi. I'm Chief of Engineering Division at San Diego APCD, and um, I have uh, permitting uh, emission inventory and Air Toxic Hotspots Program in Engineering Division. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to talk about the uh, updating you on proposal from BAE for reducing the potential health risk from their operation located in the community. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, BAE is a ship repair facility that's located in the community that works on both military and commercial ships. I believe after me, Lydia, Lesser would be giving more detail about their operation. Uh, but they have a type of operation that can create emissions, including welding, abrasive blasting, 
uh, coating operation and some solvent cleaning as well as uh, diesel engines. Uh, BAE was required to submit a proposal to the district to reduce their potential health risks from their operation, uh, which was a requirement as part of the California Air Toxic Hotspots Program, as well as District Rule 1210. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of the hotspots program is to identify facilities that can release air emissions and those emissions can create elevated health risks that can potentially negatively impact the public. Uh, for example, certain air emissions can cause skin eye irritation, asthma, uh, and long-term long impacts such as cancer and other heart diseases. Uh, District Rule 1210 established public notification and risk reduction requirements for facilities that can create elevated health risks. And as a result, PAE was subject to District Rule 1210, and they did conduct public notification and submitted a proposal to the district on how they're planning to reduce the potential health risks. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this just shows the uh, thresholds for public notification and risk reduction uh, under District Rule 1210. And as you can see, the acute health risk, which refers to short-term uh, health effects uh, associated with uh, BAE's operation was above one that required a uh, health risk reduction uh, plan. We can go to the next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the uh, contribution of different metals. In this case, nickel uh, contributes almost 100%, 99%. And uh, nickel emissions come from welding and abrasive blasting operations that can cause this elevated health risk. Uh, the red line on the right hand map shows the area uh, of impact of elevated health risk. And the blue line shows the facility boundary. And as you can see on the left side, which is the western portion of the boundary, there is uh, some impact to the nearby businesses. The intent of the map was to show how far this uh, uh, impact extends beyond the property lines. If we can go to the next slide, please. So as required by Rule 1210, uh, District Rule 1210, BAE proposed to reduce its health risk below the threshold by focusing on the welding operation, which was contributing to the majority of the emissions, nickel emissions. Uh, for indoors welding operations, BAE proposed to continue to collect and control the emissions by using a high efficiency filtration system. And for outdoors operations, BAE, BAE proposed that by December of 2025 or sooner, to either replace 20% of its welding operations that emit nickel by utilizing a new technology called mechanically attached fitting or MAF. The picture on the uh, right side shows welding operations which can create toxic emissions and the proposed technology. Uh, if BAE is unable to replace 20% of the welding with mechanically attached fitting technology, then it'll comply with an hourly emission limit of nickel by the same date, December, 2025. Now this technology is used for connecting pipes and so is not feasible to replace all welding operations. And that's why 20% is what the target is. Now both approaches, whether it's welding replacement with MAF technology or the emission limitations would bring the risk uh, below the threshold levels of rule, District Rule 1210. Uh, our district rule allows up to five years to implement risk reduction plans, and the district approved BAE's, BAE's proposal and incorporated that into conditions of a permit to ensure the measure would be enforceable and implemented in a timely manner. We can go to the next slide, please. So BAE's permit that includes this reduction measure has been issued and posted on the district website. Uh, BAE will be implementing the risk reduction requirements and uh, it'll be 
enforced by the district to make sure they, they are implemented. Uh, until then, annual notifications will continue uh, by BAE to make sure that they are informing the public if the risk is still above those thresholds and uh, until fully implemented and the risk thresholds are below, risk levels are below the thresholds, the notification will continue. And uh, in addition, BAE is required to submit another health risk assessment uh, based on their 2021 emissions by November 7th of this year. And a health risk assessment is just a, a analysis that can calculate what the potential health risks are based on air emissions. If we can go to my last slide, um, as uh, district has been presenting, uh, public engagement is a core element of our program to reduce toxic emissions. So we would like to encourage you to sign up for district updates via its gov delivery subscription services and visit our website. Uh, BAE is not the only facility in this community that's subject to this program. So our website has an interactive mapping tool for all facilities under this program and all documents related to public notification and risk reduction. And that concludes my presentation. And at this point, uh, I'll pass this on to Lydia. Thank you so much, Hassan. Lydia? Thank you, Mosin. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. I good? All right. Um, yeah, thanks for describing the whole process. It, it, was, it was really uh, good to work with you guys through the whole process, I will say. Um, so start. I just wanted to give you guys kind of an overview of, of a little bit more about mechanically attached fittings and some other things that we're doing at the AE Systems to help reduce emissions here locally. Um, so you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so, so BA systems, we've, um, that area has been a shipyard since the early 1900s, but um, back in 1979, that was when BA systems um, took over the ship's repair site. Um, it is a full repair ship facility. It consists of 12 acres of land. Um, and I'm sorry, I did not include the machine shop over there, but that is included in the 12, uh, the 12 acres. It's just not um, on the shorefront there. Uh, we also have three piers. We have um, three piers where you can put a show on one side and then the other two, you can have two shows on each side. Um, fully at full capacity, we could have seven um, Navy ships in our yard, although that's, I will say it's very rare. Um, we have two full dry docks, uh, Pride of California, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, in the next few slides is over to the left side, the north side of the facility. It is the largest dry dock in California, and it can lift about 55,000 tons. Um, so the larger ships like the, the USS Essex and the USS Boxer. And we've even managed to fit two destroyers in there at one time. Um, we also have the Pride of San Diego, which can lift 22,000 tons. Um, that is uh, one of our older dry docks, and I'll talk about that one as well. We have some plans on helping reduce the emissions coming from that particular dry dock. Um, one thing I'll point out right now is when they are in that position with a ship inside, um, they are fully electric, uh, both of those dry docks. They are plugged in 100% of the time and all, um, you know, like all the power, et cetera, that goes to them. Occasionally, we do have subcontractors that bring in diesel engines, but we also have a permit with the district that helps us maintain a higher quality engine on our site um, by requirement, which is helpful. Um, birthing barges are also used on our site, so the ship does come in and it has a Navy crew. So that Navy crew actually lives and sleeps in our facility. Um, they're like little smaller barges along the pier. Um, we also have shops throughout our facility that help us get the job done, such as carpentry, pipe fitting, um, sheet metal work, electrical, and structural to do all the repairs. Joanna, you can move to the next slide. So a little bit more about what a mechanically attached fittings are. Um, I, I know Mosin had said this is a new technology. I will state that it's really not a new technology. It was developed in the 1980s. Um, it was the Navy that did take their time um, really deciding that that was a good 
use on a Navy ship. Because as you can imagine, when you're in a ship, uh, there's a lot of flexing and, and movement that goes on. And so uh, for a long time, there was a large concern that those mechanically attached fittings might not stay attached. Um, but over time and testing and, and proof of concept, they've, uh, part of the Navy called NAVC has fully accepted the use of these mechanically attached fittings. Um, the great part about that is that a lot of our work is done physically on ships, um, which causes fire concerns, right? And if you all remember the Bonham Richard fire, um, that did create a lot of smoke into our local uh, community. So this actually reduces fire risk, um, so no hot work, right? All the fumes and the smoke are not produced. Um, that's part of what our permit will, will show is we will show the amount of uh, fumes that we, we basically avoid by, by doing the mechanically attached fittings where we can, um, which makes it safer for not only our employees, but also um, our neighbors and community. We also have um, the joint reliability because it's machined, you're not relying on an individual's ability to do a weld um, in some pretty tough to reach spots. And um, you can go ahead and move on to the next screen, Joanne, or the next words. <laughs> um, the installation time, again, it's a fraction of the time required um, for welding or brazed connections on a ship. If you can imagine carrying all your supplies up there, setting up containment, ventilation, um, getting a, a permit from the ship and getting into that space and doing your work. Instead, you just walk up with this little toolbox, um, you put your connections together, hit that um, hydraulic button. Um, I don't know if you can see the tool down there below, but it's basically a hydraulic system um, and it, it just pushes the two pipes together. Again, the training um, is, is significantly less than what a welder would need to have. Um, and the pipe sizes are, are currently restricted to two and a half inches, but I will note we, we work very closely with NAPC and SWARMAC to try and get larger size pipes approved on ships because they are um, more widely accepted now. So we're working on that. We can go ahead to the next slide. Um, one new technology that I know a few of you, I saw Allison on the phone, um, her and I, work together this year on, on getting a permit for our site for a, a newer technology called cold spray. Um, cold spray has been around for quite some time as well, but the technology has improved. So um, now they have a, a technology that is supersonic and supersonic deposition technology um, basically just means it takes um, a metal powder and it shoots it through this system with an inert gas at such high speeds that when it hits the surface of that metal, it actually flattens out and adheres just like your welding. So you get like a welding bond, but with heat that is extremely minimal. It's about the temperature of your oven at home. So there is no um, heat, no toxic fumes, no smoke produced. Um, they're gonna be doing some air testing this year because there's actual HEPA filtration put at the back end. Um, just to make sure that there is no uh, dust coming out of the operation that might be inhalable. Um, there is no limit to thickness. So imagine um, in the case that we used it this year, there was a, a rudder stock off of um, a huge rudder off of a ship. It's like basically the big post that holds it all together. And it um, needed to be built back up. It had worn down in a way that um, it, it needed a metal added to it and then machined back to size. Um, what we were able to do without going and purchasing a new one or sitting there and brazing uh, layers of metal on, which can also damage the surface and cause cracking if it's done incorrectly, we did all of this with a cold spray, um, built that up, and then machined it back to exactly what we needed. So it was, it was phenomenal. Um, I think, that, was there another slide for cold spray? I think you can move forward. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a big problem with Navy ships is long lead time. Um, some critical parts that, that are very difficult to machine can have year to year and a half lead time. So allowing that surface just to be built back up is kind of the way of the future. And I'm, I'm really expecting this to take off. Um, there is a site that just opened up in National City where they'll do that indoors for smaller parts. But what's great is they can come to us for those bigger parts like the... <laughs> Um, a red, rudder shaft, and when I say rudder shaft, you think like two, three stories tall, right? It's, it's a huge piece of metal that holds those big rudders onto ships. 
So um, having pop-up fills is critical for that type of work, but you can also take smaller things and, and get them fixed at their shop. And right now the Navy is sponsoring it, so, so it's even a, a better option to try and get it off the floor. Can we go to the next slide? Um, some other things I, I did want to focus on away from welding that we're doing to reduce emissions. Um, back in 2000, late 2016, we brought in the dry dock I had mentioned earlier, the Pride of California. Um, some of the, the great things about this newer dry dock, you can see the two cranes up there on both sides of the wing wall, those are fully electric. Um, the electric crane over to the left of the picture actually services all of Pier 1 as well. So when we put, put a ship over there, you kind of get a two for one and we didn't have to you know, use an older diesel crane to, to service that, that side of the pier. Um, it's equipped with LED lighting throughout the entire uh, dry dock, which reduces our energy usage. You can go to the next slide. Um, there is uh, the paint that was used to, to coat it is non-toxic. There's no lead, no copper. It, um, it, it really is clean for San Diego Bay. Um, we also have a rainwater collection system that is available um, to collect rain, and then we put that into the sewer so nothing goes into the bay. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I did want to show you guys very quickly, like what, go ahead, you can play that. Um, what a dry dock does. <laughs> very long process, so this is set up quite a bit. Thank you. So that's, that's the ship that just left our facility recently, the Essex, and it's back at the base. So we're continuing to work on it there for a while. Um, one other thing that we have done, it was pretty much at the same time frame as getting that dried off. Um, pier 4 was uh, reconfigured, and we installed also on that pier a fully electric crane that you can see there, um, the blue and yellow. Um, and I think that's it for this slide. Not a whole lot to talk about, just less emissions. Um, some projects that we've accomplished this year, this is uh, the 2023 year. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been testing out grant vehicles um, through uh, to, to try out class eight semi trucks. Uh, we did have an old 1987 Peterbilt that was used to pull shafts off of our dry dock. Um, the big challenge was to find something that could do that activity um, so we could retire that older vehicle um, that, that could tow a large shaft through with a high clearance, basically, because you deal with the tides when you're coming on and off of dry dock. So um, we did uh, finally land on the Peterbilt. Uh, we have a 2023 Peterbilt. The one on the left there was one of our, our latest grants that was the one that we ended up purchasing, which is the one in the center. I'm still working on getting that one wrapped. Hopefully I'll get that done soon um, and, and have it all decorated up. But it's been working on a daily basis throughout the community um, and taking things to our warehouse, to the base, whatever it is we need done. Um, the great thing about that, it doesn't have to go uh, long haul. So I, I, if you see there, it has a range of 180 miles, which for some truck drivers might not work very well, but for us, it really works perfectly. Um, and so far it's been operating um, without any issues. That's the other great thing about electric is there's very little maintenance involved. Um, over to the right there, you can also see a 22K forklift. We had a very old diesel um, forklift that even our employees would complain about when we had to use it because it was just so smelly. 
Um, so we finally uh, got this 22K, got a little delay during COVID, but it's up and running officially and um, they're using it on a daily basis in our yard. And um, you can go ahead to the next screen. Oh, sorry, I forgot we had extra words on here, but yeah, you can keep going. <laughs> Um, one of the more fun projects that I've had this year is um, uh, developing these these uh, jellyfish bots is the actual name. Um, they're these great little robots that we uh, discussed with the state to use with our low carbon fuel standard credits. Um, when we do uh, drop things into the water, which uh, unfortunately, as you can imagine, working over the water on a daily basis, um, doing industrial work, things do fall in the water. Um, and we do get a lot of other floating trash that just comes into our facility. So we bought these robots to help us um, clean up trash as it is floating in the yard. And, um, and it also can clean up oil spills. So if you wanna press the little play button there over on the right hand side, um, you guys can see it in action. That was one of the first, that's kind of a, a slight oil sheen, um, not a major spill, but it was just something we, we saw in the bay. And, um, in the past, uh, unfortunately, when you see those types of machines, they're typically not recoverable. Um, I will say this little guy, we put some little hydrophobic pads, that's what you can see in the white there, um, and it did a phenomenal job. I came back like 15 minutes later when the guys were running it on my team, and, and there was no sign of any oil. So that was really exciting. And then that map over here to the middle that you can see um, the, the, the different colors. Um, that's another added benefit of this device. It can actually take maps of the basin floor. So it is like a Roomba. I can just set it up in a specific area and say, um, go clean trash in this area. And while it's cleaning up, it will also map the basin floor, sends all that data to a cloud, and then just builds this map for me. So that's, that's very helpful for when you're bringing in ships um, to, to know that you have all the right clearance and no sediment has settled. And hopefully there's a lot of other different attachments we can put on it in the future that can help us with other activities we do. Only it could dive, right? Head <laughs> um, to the next screen. Lydia, just want to do a quick time check since we're getting close oh, to are we out? the end of the hour. Um, just oh, want to okay. give, You're yeah, right. we can. Um, Not a problem share the slides with folks afterwards. There are just two more about um, other electrification projects at BAE, yeah. but we wanted to give um, folks uh, maybe time for one or two questions Not on the problem. risk reduction plan. Thank you so much, Lydia. Yeah. Great. We're at the end of the hours so i know folks have absorbed a lot of information now um just wanted to see if folks have any questions i think i did see one from janice in the chat where in national city is the new location um i believe this might have been the dry dock uh you're muted lydia Sorry, um, she's probably asking about the cold spray uh, company, which is called VRC. And um, it's in a real industrial area. I've been there one time when they had a class kind of introducing the technology. But if you look up VRC, um, you would probably be able to find them. Thank you, Lydia. And Sylvia? So you had your hand raised? Yes. Uh Yes, uh, Lydia, just want a quick comment. I appreciate the presentation that was given, uh, very informative. Um, but I do want to applaud or appreciate um, the extra efforts that you're putting, like uh, the better paint, paint not lead-wise, um, and that, that jelly robot, uh, that's pretty cool. So <laughs> just want to appreciate and um, mention that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you can tell everyone their names are Wally and Ava. We have two of them. And we plan to come to all the local cleanups. So if you guys ever want to bring your kids out, we just uh, partnered with the Living Coast Discovery Center um, so that hopefully we can take them to their cleanups and um, let kids play with them. They're really fun. Excellent. I like the Wally one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Nick, just one quick question or comment. Yeah, it's it's more of a quick comment, uh, Chewy. Um, Lydia, thank you for the presentation. You know, I I 
I've been kind of following the risk reduction plan uh, process. I know it's been a very long process, um, but I, I just wanted to vocalize um, how important this risk reduction effort is for folks that work there at your facility. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to see that there's been some progress recently. Um, and we hope that it continues because again, there's a lot of folks from our neighborhoods that work there at BAE. Um, and these efforts to reduce cancer risk are so important. Absolutely. I agree. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. I'd like to respond to, to Lydia's um, answer about the national city location. Thank you, Lydia, for your presentation. Very informative, lots of really cool technology. But just even in, in addressing, this, for example, that was my concern, right? Like there's now, it now has been moved. There's a new area in National City, not on the port, but a lot of us are actually in that area, in that very industrial area. Um, that's the thing about living on the west side or serving on the west side is that there are industrial right next to homes. And so, yes, real industrial, but so just a lot of times I appreciate I appreciate the efforts, but also want to ground it in the reality of, you know, being really conscientious of that, that real industrial area is probably next to homes as well. And so um, doing the most, not doing the least. And it seems like you really are trying and you're being very comprehensive, but just want to ground it there um, because that's very much the reality for a lot of folks that live in our community is that that real industrial area is really close to our homes. Um, so thank you for doing the most, and we look forward to more presentations from you and more updates. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. And I, you know, I will just, I mean, it's still an industrial activity, right? But it is, it is so much less emissions um, than welding. You know, it's just when you add that heat and you get that toxic smoke, that's what really is the cancer causing. And um, you know, hopefully they'll work with the district this year and do some source testing. I was just talking to their, their chemist, Jeremy, today, and they're really excited to like really show that, that what they're doing there is, is, is a very good process. And it's hopefully the future of um, brazing and, and that kind of heavy buildup welding um, that's really going to be good for the environment and good for our, for our health. Thank you so much. John? Yes, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, BAE and you for the presentation. But I'll tell you, the one thing that really strikes me is this. Technology is now finally catching up to what needs to happen to help, if you will, clean our air, our community, and um, solve much of the health risk. You know, much of this has been a long battle. Um, and technology is now finally starting to catch up. And I really, truly appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. And if folks didn't catch, um, Mayani shared a link on how to register for updates for the risk reduction plan and the hotspots program. So feel free to visit those links um, when you have time. This time I wanna, um, Thank you all again for all your participation today. I know it was a lot of um, engagement, but great to see um, all the interest and all the items that, that were presented today. Um, and we'll be sure to send an update email to folks um, next week, um, just summarizing and, and with the presentation items for folks who are, um, are interested in, in seeing more. Um, and lastly, um, just a quick reminder that our next meeting will be on October 24th, same time, 5 p.m., um, virtually over Zoom. Thank you all again and um, wishing everyone a good night. Thanks, have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Buenas noches, good night. Thank you. Good Thanks, night. everyone. Thanks. Buenas noches. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. And uh, uh, Chewy and to the rest of the gang, awesome job. Thank you so much. <laughs>